Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Do you like sales? I don't mean do you like to, to sell things doing that work. Do you like when you go to the store and something is on sale? I know I do. A few, a few years ago, uh, I had my eye on something that had been on sale uh, for quite some time. Uh, I didn't have, have a grill, and I really wanted a grill, a nice propane grill with a, with a burner on the side. You know the look of them. Well, there was this one I had my eye on, but it was just a little bit too far out of my price range. It started at about 300 I waited a few months, and it, kind of the time when, when there it seems like stores are trying to like will spring into action by putting out all the stuff for spring, the, the mowers, the rakes, the, the grills. By that time, it had actually gone down in price a little bit, and that was about like 250 I thought I could probably spend that money still a better way than just on a, a selfish thing like a grill, so I was going to wait a little bit longer. I waited a few months all the way to about the springtime, and, and now the grill had gone down, and it was like about 180 from 300 to 180, that's, that's a pretty good price. But for some reason, my wife wouldn't let me buy it still. <laughs> so I waited longer. Kept waiting and waiting until the, the new year. So this is waiting for almost 18 months entirely, and now the grill was about $99. And I thought, this is a steal of a deal. Every time I'd go to the store, I'd walk by to make sure it was still there. And we finally decided we're going to get it. So we, we go to the store, we're going to get it. I beeline it right to where that grill's going to be, and it's gone. <laughs> it's not there. I waited too long. During my vicar year, I had... Uh, student in my catechism class. His name was John. And if you go in my office, I have this, this picture. It's got all these different colors, all of them on it. Um, from left to right, you'll, you'll see some, some bright colors, then a little bit less bright on the bottom. Then at the very bottom, there's like this, this green part, kind of like a hill, a uh, rich green. On top of all those colors are, are three crosses. It's one of the most encouraging pictures that I have. See, John, he was a, a great student, uh, but he didn't like to talk a lot. He didn't like to talk, and to get him to open up, we would have to go through all these different projects. Like when I taught him about the kingdom of the keys, I got all these different keys and all these different locks, and then I'd ask him some questions, and he would tell me every single answer, and he'd have every single answer right. But if I were just to ask him without doing anything, he, he would never talk to me. His mom told me that, uh, a story about John when he was a kid. He was a kid, he got like a cut and an infection, and, and he had warts all over his hands. They tried the typical remedies to get those warts to remove them, but nothing was working. These were, were stubborn warts. They wouldn't go away. Finally, they were going to go and see a specialist to get them, uh, I, I don't know, cryogenically frozen off or something like that. But John said, no, we don't have to go. And his mom's like, well, John, we're, we're going. Like, what's wrong? Are you scared? Are you, are you worried? It'll be okay. Nothing's going to happen. He's like, no, you guys, you guys taught me that if I believe that God is all-powerful and he can do everything, and if God wants to, he'll take him away. So I ask God to take him away. And if he wants him taken away, then they'll be taken away. If not, I guess not. And even though his mom was completely floored by such childlike faith, she said, John, we're still going to the doctor tomorrow. The next day, in, in her words, woke up in all of those warts were gone. You can look at something that was once here and now it's gone in two different ways. You can look at it as a missed opportunity. You waited. You kept waiting. You're looking for that, that perfect opportunity, that perfect moment to strike and then it's gone. Or you can look at it in a good way. When something bad was here, but now that bad thing is taken away. And then when that bad thing is now gone, you're relieved. The weight of the world off your shoulders, it, it seems so wonderful. In our lesson from Isaiah, he talks about something that was going to be removed. Something that was once there was now gone. It was a, a bad thing. It was not a good thing, and it was going to be taken away. 
The people were living in distress and gloom and doom, and it, it was a dark, dark place. We've gone through Isaiah for many weeks now. We've talked about the situation that he's in. Maybe he didn't realize how, how bad it was. The idolatry, which is really an adulterous relationship with God. They cheated on God. They had made themselves to be champion beer drinkers and wine drinkers. They prided themselves in that glory. Their respect for the elderly had completely gone out the window. Well, you know what? It kind of sounds a lot like this day and age, doesn't it? Kind of sounds like the world that we live in now. If you think our world is dark, well, it was dark back then too. Isaiah writes to this people who need a change, who need something to come into their lives to change the way that they've been living, to change how they've been going through the motions and, and thinking that everything's going to be fine. He writes about the captivity, how they're going to go away, but how God is going to bring them back. And here he writes about more than that. This isn't a lesson just for them, just for Jacob's race, as we talked about a week ago. But this is for all people, all nations, every single one of them, that God's going to take away the darkness of their sin. Because the people were living in darkness, but they were about to see a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. This darkness wasn't just on the surface. This darkness was through and through. It was like a shadow that followed them around. Have you ever tried to, to run away from your shadow? I hope not, because you look pretty funny. And you'd also never accomplish your task. Your shadow will always be there. That's what this is saying, except this is a shadow of death. Death lingers here and there and all over. It's because of who we are as sinners. That darkness of the shadow of death is out there waiting to get us because one day it will get the darkness in here and it will take us. That's the consequence of our sin. So Isaiah says the people walking in darkness, in their sin, the shadow of death all around them, a light has dawned. There's hope. There's something forward to look forward to. That sounds silly. There's something to look forward to. They have a Savior who's going to come into the world. This way that you're living, this debauchery, this sin, well, it will be taken care of. The way that Isaiah describes it, when the light comes into the world, it says, you have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice in the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. They go from this terrible state to this, to this wonderful state. They were in darkness, but now they would be in light. So why is our world still in darkness? Why can we look around and say what's happening in Isaiah's day is very similar to what's happening in our day? Hasn't the light already come? Hasn't Jesus done what he's supposed to do and accomplish God's mission to, to live the perfect life, to die on the cross and rise from the dead? Shouldn't we be walking in the light as he said? So why aren't we? And why is the world seemingly more messed up than ever before? Yes, our world is a dark place. Our world is all full of sin. And, and maybe the problem is that we keep pointing out there. We can't simply say that the devil made me do it. Sure, he, he tries to pull us away every day. We can't simply say that the world is so bad. But that darkness is in us. And sometimes that darkness wants to strangle the light that God has given us. Wants to stomp it out and snuff out the wick that's right there so that we don't look like we're light. Sometimes we pride ourselves on being just like the world. Yeah, I go to church on Sundays, but between Sundays, I'm just like you. And we pretend that's a good thing. We pretend that us going out into the world pretending like we're from this sin-corrupt, dark world is good, but it's not. It's very bad. All it does is, is show people that we don't really care about being light. We don't really care how God took us from this terrible, sin-sick world and, and made us to be beautiful, glorious, because of what he's done for us. 
Maybe we have a little bit more to contribute to this world than we realize. Maybe the way that we point people to Jesus isn't, isn't just by being here and that's it. Maybe it's how we live out there. And maybe as we live out there, as we let our light shine, as we are salt and light for the earth, people will see the light. Not, not look at us, not my light, but a reflection of the light of the Son of God. Why, why are you different? Why don't you do these things that everyone does? Well, it's because I have a Savior. Could I tell you about him? He's changed everything about me. Maybe he'll change everything about you too. That's what Isaiah is telling us here. He's talking about this light shining in the darkness of our sin, chasing it away. That's what this season of Epiphany is all about. In these last few weeks, we've been looking at all of these wonderful gospel sections from Isaiah. And do you know why Isaiah says what he says right here? It's because he knows he was in darkness too. This is chapter 9 of Isaiah, but a few before when God calls him. Do you know what he said? This was before he, he jumps up and down and says, send me, send me. He says, no, don't send me. I don't want to go. I'm not qualified to do these things. He says, I'm a man of sinful lips. I have said things that weren't right. Or, or maybe, maybe that translation says, I have not said things that I should have said. So you know what God does? For the very sin that's haunting him, that's weighing heavy on his heart, he has an angel take a tongue and a coal from the altar and place it on his lips and says, you're forgiven. He says, you're forgiven for whatever is ailing you. I don't know what's eating you right now. Maybe it's a fact that we, we aren't light. Maybe it's a fact that we aren't doing all we can for the gospel or whatever it may be. But imagine God is right here, right now, using that angel, whatever is weighing heavy on your heart, and placing it right there and saying, you are forgiven. It's wiped away. That's what he did for Isaiah. And then when God does that for Isaiah, you know what he does? He says, look at all this work out there. Look at all these things that we can do. Who could possibly go and do this stuff? And Isaiah's sitting there. He's like, I just saw what God did for me. I was down in the dumps. I was in gloom and doom in the darkness of my sin. But he changed all of that with his kindness, his grace, and his forgiveness. And so then Isaiah jumps up and down and says, here I am, send me, send me. Well, here we are too. We have the same message that Isaiah has. We've been going through it week after week, looking at that wonderful gospel. Your sins are forgiven. Jesus paid the price for everything that you've done wrong, but it's not just you. It's for the whole world. That means your family members, that means your friends, your neighbors, your acquaintances, your associates, all of them. Maybe if we live the way that John told us, we could, we could tell them about our Savior without actually telling them about our Savior. Maybe we could do what Jesus did. Uh, of course, we can't always do it like Jesus did, but he just said, come. Come and see. Come follow me. Don't, don't follow me if I'm doing this, but follow my Savior. Isaiah talks about this light in the darkness. John tells us that now, because of what Jesus has done, you've been made light. So be the light. Because there's two ways you can look at something that was once here and now is gone. Our sin was here, but now it's been removed, washed away, completely atoned for by Jesus. That's very, very good. But there's also something else that might be gone that we don't want to leave. And those are those opportunities that we have. If you're waiting for the right moment, if you're waiting for the, the right price, it's never going to happen. That opportunity might slip away, and you go to the store, and the grill's gone. I mean, you go to the person, and they're not there anymore. Make the most of the opportunities God has given us. Be the light that goes into the world, because one day it's going to be gone, those opportunities. But thank God that you are light. Thank God that he has made you light, because you were once darkness. We can say that the darkness is gone. It's been lifted all because of Jesus. Amen. Please stand.